I'm Rob Snow. I work here at SUNY Canton. I'm the Instructional Support Associate for Game Design and Development, IT, Computer Information Systems, Cybersecurity, and Physics. Today I want to talk to you about our new cybersecurity lab that we're constructing in Neville Dye North 124. Now, you're going to see a lot of reports regarding this, people with ideas, and I have already sat in on a number of meetings regarding this lab space. So what I want to talk about today, while I will discuss the lab uh, policies, the lab design, the virtual space, and the physical space, I'm going to talk a little bit toward the end of the video about what I would like to see from our cybersecurity program, from our lab, from the point of view of someone who's going to have to support it. But first, I believe we need to discuss a little bit about SUNY Canton and what we're dealing with for space. Before I took a job as the Instructional Support Associate, I was the infrastructure technician. And I worked directly with the back-end folks in IT working on SUNY Canton's infrastructure. This is going to be very important to understand as we start to discuss more about cybersecurity and some of the considerations and concerns that the folks in IT have for our new space. SUNY Canton is a Class B network. And at the very middle of our network is a core. And that core goes out to the world, right? So everything here is the Internet of Things, right? Is, is the world, okay? Internally, this core is connected to all the buildings in our, in our fiber loop. It's connected to servers, right? It's connected to other buildings. It's connected internally. There's also, uh, more importantly though, it is specifically connected to Neville Dine, the the building. In Neveldyne, the building is split up into two parts. You have Neveldyne North and Neveldyne South. We're going to talk about Neveldyne North because that is where the actual uh, that is where the actual lab is going to be. In Neveldyne North, there's a closet in room one seventeen which is between the classroom in 115 and the digital studio in 119. And in that closet are two switch stacks. Each, each of them have four switches. Having worked on those switches, I can personally tell you that things are not very well organized there. Some organizations might take entire blocks of ports on a switch and designate those ports for rooms in particular. Here at SUNY Canton, we don't do that. So when we talk about Neveldyne and the network here, from Neveldyne North, you have individual PC connections as opposed to room connections. This is really important to understand when we're talking about the laboratory space that we're going to be constructing. That could possibly leak... Uh, malicious software out into our network. That's the hardware infrastructure for SUNY Canton. You have each individual PC going back to a switch stack controlling a building which goes from which is routed through a building router to the core. And there are some protection measures in between firewalls, programs that's looking for anything malicious but nothing too serious. Software-wise, everything is in an Active Directory domain. This is a very popular service, and the way things are organized in Active Directory is you have groups. So you might have a student group, and you might have a faculty group. 
And I know for a fact at SUNY Canton, we have a PC lab group. So all labs on campus, all lab computers are in, on campus, are in one Active Directory group. And all users fall in certain categories, fac faculty or student. These computers that we're going to use in our new cybersecurity lab are obviously going to go into a PC lab group. And that group governs all PC labs on campus. So we're talking about South 117, South 119, North 128. Uh, North 119 is considered a PC lab for this. So all of those machines are tied together in the same Active Directory subgroup. Also, structurally for our Class B network, those machines are all tied into the same subnet. So they're all communicating in the same group of computers. So they're all talking at, uh, forgive me, it's 137.37. I don't remember the particular subnet. But it's got its own section on the network for PC labs. So why is all this important to know? Well, what we're looking at doing here at SUNY Canton in Neville Dine North 124 is building a cybersecurity lab that's going to invite people in to handle malicious code, to uh, experiment with computers, and this code, these computers could possibly leak out into the greater network. So if we're working on a PC, in Neville Dine North, that's on Switch Stack 2, uh, Switch 3, port 12. And this computer happens to be the machine that I'm working on. And if this machine is fully connected to the network, just like everything else is, and I'm experimenting with a particularly nasty self-replicating worm that will replicate itself throughout a network, and it happens to get past the protections we have. Remember, the protections are generally found here, not necessarily here, and not here. This is a direct connection to these switches. So it's easy that something could replicate from this PC all the way to all the other PCs in Neveldyne. And in fact, I've seen network issues in Neveldyne affect the entire campus rapidly. Um, there was an incident where uh, we had a network cable that was looping in Neveldyne, and that one loop among the switch stacks took the entire campus down. So we already know that it's possible for something to replicate and harm the network from within. So what we need to do is make sure that any computer used by cybersecurity where students are going to be handling malicious code is completely segregated from the campus network. There's a few other issues and concerns that IT have. Uh, I know there's been some discussion about honeypot files, inviting hackers uh, to come in and hack uh, a website to acquire this file. And if you can do that, you know, maybe you get some kind of a scholarship to come to this college, right? Our IT department is two people, Brian Fetzi and Joe LaRue. This, I should say, this is our system administration department. And they also serve as our IT security personnel. Two people. Two people for the entire network. I have heard Brian say many times, especially when talking about honeypot files, that he has concerns about inviting people to hack our network. One of our greatest strengths at SUNY Canton is the fact that we're relatively innocuous. That is, nobody's actively looking uh, for SUNY Canton to hack our website, right? We're a small school, 3,000 students. Uh, there's not a lot of financial transactions. So there's 
a, not much reward for the risk one would have in uh, in in breaking into our network. And Brian and Joe, they want to keep it that way. Trust me. Brian and Joe uh, use mainly software, passive software, to detect any threats. Uh, by the time something comes in, it's in the form of a report that's days or sometimes weeks after. And then they make a, uh, a, a reactionary uh, adjustment to the network. So there's no more harm. So again, we're talking about introducing threats from within from our students. And inviting threats from outside, from potential students, or even people who just want to show off, right? So we're talking about a lot of threat to a network that's already uh, under secure, you could say. Um, something that a, a skilled ex expert could easily break through. Now, I... I want to talk a little bit about, now that you understand what we're doing, what we have to work with, uh, I want to talk a little bit about what we want the cybersecurity program to be able to do. So in cyber, and, and at SUNY Canton as a whole, we want people to have hands-on experience, right? Right? This is what sets SUNY Canton aside from, say, SUNY Poly or Albany, who has a cybersecurity program. Um, I'm sorry, I misspoke. SUNY Plattsburgh, who has a cybersecurity program. A lot of those schools focus on the uh, uh, theory, on the computer science side. Here, we're trying to get cybersecurity experts who are getting actual hands-on uh, experience with the software. So, to that end, we need a laboratory that facilitates that. But we've already seen the issue, right? We can't have a lab that's going to put all of this at risk, because that would be bad. So, how do we make a program that focuses on hands-on, real-world experience, but does not put the lab at risk. Well, there's really two options, um, and both involve quarantining that space entirely. So the first would be, rather than having Neville Dine North 124 come in from the campus network, I'm just going to use that as this whole mess, so rather than having Neville Dye North 124 come in from our core, we get a special uh, T1 line that's going to service uh, just Neville Dye North 124. So this is a, a, a line coming in from Spectrum. It's it's uh, demarked somewhere at Neville Dye North 124. When we run cabling, it goes to a switch that's in that room and then out. That's probably the easiest way for us to handle this, but it leads to some concerns and issues. First and foremost, this room, one, NN 124, would not be on the network, right? So if uh, you're teaching and you need to access some files. You can't do that from a computer in an N124 unless there was a speci specially designated computer. But then you couldn't show. You'd have to have a different computer to show uh, uh, what you're teaching in the lab, right? Because, again, you don't want to be introducing malicious software to our campus network. So one solution is a T1. Now, working at SUNY can't listen. This is a state school. It's not exactly the wealthiest school. Uh, this is a lot of money. This is a lot of redoing the infrastructure. This is buying new switches, routers, a uh, whole data uh, network uh, do uh, redo over in that space. Financially, it would work, but it's going to be a little expensive. So this is a, a, a concern that is as far as I know right now, off the table. We are not looking at getting a dedicated line. So the term that I've heard come up a lot, and, you know, having sat in on these meetings, obviously I'm a little privileged in the information, is having a sandbox that's, that's quarantined from the network. Okay? And I'll get into what a sandbox is in just a moment. But the real question is, how do we do this? 
And what we're looking at right now, um, you know, we're obviously investigating the best way to do this, but it's going to be another way of uh, blocking Neville Dye North 124 from the rest of the campus network. And that's going to be done either through hardware or software or a mix of both. And we're talking like heavy duty firewalls. So you would have campus network. And then 124, I'm sorry, Neville Dine, Nev Building, right? You would have security, so firewalls, uh, and then you would have 124. And this would be able to protect most of what's going on out here from this room. But not all, because there's additional concerns. Now, at the beginning of the video, I mentioned that I'd be talking about the lab design and the lab policy. And I know we want to talk about it virtually a little bit, uh, so I'm going to go into that real quick. So we're talking about a sandbox, and when you get the idea of a sandbox, this is a space that people can play in. And there's no rules or guidelines for how you're going to play, right? You just kind of, you experience it. Things are given to you. You craft it how you want. So going away from this physical, you know, security firewalls, Neveldyne building to the network, we also can create a virtual space. Now, virtual machines are very easy to set up, as we've all seen. You go into... Uh, you know, you go into certain programs, you run the kind of virtual machine you want. One of the problems with the, uh, a virtual space is we would require some hardware that would be able to host that space. So we're talking about dedicated servers in Neveldyne North 124 that would be specific to host virtual machines that we can play on. You know, another downside for virtual machines is people, uh, you know, yes, you can use it as a learning tool. Yes, there are a lot of things you can do. But in a lot of instances, uh, the virtual machine just isn't going to give you the kind of hands-on experience that some people expect from SUNY Canton. So I believe we should still set up some kind of a virtual space. I believe some of our most malicious software that would put a risk to our security firewall should be designated just to that virtual space. But we should not rely purely on virtual machines for, for our lab experiments and for our lab itself. <clears throat> so I, I would really push for more physical machines. So going back to the physical machine model, one of the problems you're going to have is things getting out. So how can things get past the security? Well, if a piece of software is particularly strong, you know, it might be able to bust through the security protocols. If there's an open uh, port somewhere here that it can sneak by, right? I mean, there's a lot of different ways that it can happen. One of the ways that can happen that we really need to pay attention to is physical security. And I'm actually talking your phone, uh, a, fl a thumb drive, a flash drive. So in the beginning, I talked about lab policies. And because this is going to be a computer lab, one of the policies I, I really, you know, obviously the, the standard computer lab policies, food and drink, um, I, I'm always an advocate for a no food and drink policy, uh, but a new policy that would be integrated into this space would be no electronics, electronics storage devices. So when we're talking about designing the lab, we're going to have to take into consideration where are students going to put their storage devices when they enter the room? If you know Neville Dine North 124, currently the room looks like this. Okay? It's got a long hallway. Professor Wong's office is here. And uh, Professor Rashid's office is here. So those spaces are out of the equation for the renovation. This is not a very wide hallway. But I still believe we can get some kind of a 
thin shelving on on one side or the other where students would be required to place their cell phones and any other storage devices. I would almost go so far as to say that all phones off. Because as we all know, a phone that's locked is still sending and receiving messages. Off or at least airplane mode, right? Um, that might protect people inside. I think there's some more considerations if we're going to break into that realm of cybersecurity, uh, hacking people's uh, uh, wireless transmissions. I think there's even more considerations, maybe even some kind of an off-campus space or a mobile lab that we could do elsewhere. Because, you know, right here you have the electrical ra electrical labs. Here you've got NN128 computer labs, so I think there's a lot of concerns with people in the area, even someone passing by the hallway. But it is imperative that we make sure that all storage devices are stored outside of the lab space. So what else do we need in the lab? Now, from in survey of cybersecurity, we've learned that cybersecurity involves a lot of networking, right? So even though we are not going to have access to this network and we're not going to have access to that infrastructure, we need to build some kind of an infrastructure internally so our students can utilize it. Uh, I know there's been a lot of discussion regarding what that's going to look like personally. One of the ideas that, that I've really liked and I think is a great, great notion is a setup sort of like Neville Dine North 128, where you've got banks of computers, right? These are your workstations, maybe, uh, you know, six or eight at, at each, each uh, lab bench. And then at the end of the bench, you have a switch and a router that's specific for that bench. A switch and a router, switch and router. And these devices are all going to go to a central switch and router. This will allow students at these uh, benches, uh, this will allow them to sort of simulate a hack on each other. Right, either an internal hack for machines that are in their own uh, LAN, or an external hack simu simulated against machines that are in the wide area network. Uh, I do believe that's the greatest idea so far. Um, some of the concerns that I have as the instructional support associate for that space. Um, I'm not, and I don't think anybody here is ignorant to the fact that we're going to get students who might, you know, they might have an interest in uh, be, being a malicious hacker. I think that there needs to be uh, some kind of a safeguard from allowing anything worked on in here from leaving the room entirely. Um, I'm talking if, if we're working on a worm in this room. And this goes right back to my no storage devices that that worm does not leave these machines. And so an additional uh, item I think we absolutely need in Neville Dine North 124 is a camera watching to see if anybody is inserting storage devices into these computers as well as some kind of an internal Active Directory network that would manage these machines. Uh, I think everything here needs to be done independently. Maybe even students in cybersecurity will have their own special login for those computers. Uh, you know, obviously we're not going to be using our Canton logins and uh, make it as secure as possible. So if something happened and someone who wasn't maybe uh, a good person decided to use some of our software for malicious reasons, they 
br- sneak in a hard drive or a uh, flash drive, which isn't hard to do these days. They come right on keychains. They slide it sneakily into a computer while the professor isn't paying attention or steps out or something to that effect. Quickly put it onto their drive. Now they've got something that's dangerous to the outside world. And that's something that I believe that we as SUNY Canton have some kind of ownership in, in, in being required to prevent teaching this stuff to students. So I believe uh, we could really make a great lab space. Uh, I know that there's uh, some concerns with the money. Um, I do believe that uh, we we need to expand that room. I know it's been discussed to push the wall all the way back to the window. Uh, I know electrical will be extremely mad about that. Uh, you know, it happens. Um but I really think we need more space in that room. Currently, that space only holds 12 computers, and it holds it kind of cramped. If we were to reconfigure for cybersecurity, I believe we might be able to fit two tables uh, of possibly six computers at each table, and then an instructor station at the front. And even then, it'd be very cramped space uh, when we're talking about putting in the kind of networking equipment that we're going to need to simulate a network. So I, I hope you have enjoyed this video. I hope you've gotten some good insight into what my thoughts are on it. As a person who's going to be supporting this lab, I'm really excited for it. I can't wait to get it working. I really hope the school comes through and ponies up a little bit of money. Maybe not Neville Dine North 119 kind of money required, but... You know, it'd be really great to see some workhorse machines that can uh, support virtualization. It'd be great to see uh, our own switch banks, our own routers, and our own servers that will support virtualization. Um, maybe even servers tied into this network to simulate hacking a server. Uh, and I believe this school, um, in order to make a program that's worthwhile for students, I believe that they're they really need to do this as a bare minimum, especially if they, uh, this would also be if we did go with a T1 line from the outside, we would still need this kind of lab space internally. So again, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Any questions, feel free to reach out to me. This is a casual conversation between me and you. Um, but if you wa do want to contact me on a professional level, please feel free to visit. My office is Neville Dine North 119. I can be reached at snow117 at canton.edu. And I look forward to serving the cybersecurity program in the fall, uh, in the spring, and continuing from now. Thank you, and have a good day.